In addition to abiotic disorders and non-insect biotic disorders and diseases caused um, by viruses, fungi, and bacteria, we have insects that are big pests on plants, perhaps the biggest that is focused on by um, farmers and landscapers and focus of their management. So let's talk about that first. With insect pest management, as with other types of pests that we've been talking about, we're focusing on IPM. Three points to understand. You need to understand the damage that can help identify the pest. So using that damage to the plant to help you understand what pest is attacking and knowing most pets have some kind of biological control that you can always use and low levels of pests are okay for most pests to raise our tolerance level somewhat. The goal is not to get rid of every single one of your pest, but to bring their levels down low enough so that the, the plant can handle it and you don't mind how they look. There are three different types of damage to plants from insect pests. Um, chewing, sucking, and rasping. These are also just the uh, categories of plant pests. They're either these insect pests are chewers, they leave holes on, in the leaves or on the edges of the leaves, or they're sucking insect pests and they insert their small mouth part into the tissues of the plant and suck out the juices and it leaves a curling, distorted, or shriveled leaf, or rasping insects that scrape off the undersides of the leaves and leave kind of a silvered, stippled, um, dull look to the leaves. Some of the examples are listed below there. There's quite a few in each category, but this really helps us understand being able to identify the damage. Because often when you go out to a plant and you think it's been attacked by a pest, you don't see that insect pest. You just see the damage they've done. And these dam the damage um, can be um, discerned which type of damage to help lead you to the type of pest. And if, especially if you're using a biological control, you'll really want to identify that pest to know how to attack it. Also, once you've identified the pest, understanding the, the pest's life cycle too, and the phase or the stage of that pest life cycle that is the one that's the problematic one for your plant. Um, caterpillars that eat, like right now in the fall, we have a lot of um, California oak worms that are chewing up the leaves of oaks. Um, it's so, as you probably already can imagine, the caterpillars are doing the damage to the leaves, not the moths that, um, that come out later. So that again, any kind of control method or IPM type of management method would have to be focused on the caterpillars or something that came before them. But usually it's focused on the, the phase or stage of the pest life cycle that does the damage. Uh, moths, beetles, butterflies, and flies have larval stages that cause the damage to the plants. So if you go around, you know, trying to get rid of all the moths or butterflies, that's not going to really be the big problem. The aim is to control that proper life stage. The nymph stage of bugs, grasshoppers, and aphids are what cause the plant damage. And IPM c control methods aim to control that stage of life. And a bit of good news is that the life stage that consumes the most plant tissue is off the fa often the fastest growing juvenile stage and they're less resistant to control methods because they're softer and more vulnerable stage of growth. Here's some images showing you um, the type of damage from those three categories. Insect chewers, insects that do sucking like nymphs and adults that uh, whose body parts mouth parts pierce the leaves and suck out the contents of the cells, leave that kind of curled, shriveled look, um, and rasping insects with mouth parts, which can't penetrate into the tissue, but can scrape off the surface, leaving that kind of, kind of silvered look. It, those are actually cells from which the, the outer surface and epidermis has been scraped off. Here's a short list of the major chewing insect pests. And this is a close-up of the mouth parts of a couple of the chewing insect pests, beetles and ants, showing you that they do have these um, mouth parts, these mandibles that really can pierce and chew and rip off pieces of leaves. They're strong as opposed to other insects like aphids aren't, could not do this. They do not have that type of biting mouth part. An example of a fuller rose beetle 
chewing on the edges of the leaves of a rose and California oakworm just chomping up that oak leaf. A couple more chewers, um, the rose slug fly larva. Um, so that the larva of the, the, the certain type of fly is what chews and makes holes in the roses. Also a non-insect pest, but we kind of throw it in here too because it's a common plant pest is um, the snail and if you see holes in the middle of the leaves that can be a good a good um, guess that it's a snail that's doing that moving on to piercing uh, plant pests things like aphids that have this mouth part that's called a stylet like a little needle that they poke into the inside of the cells and suck out the juices and it leaves that weakened curling distorted leaf shape that same a uh, curled distorted leaf can be caused by other things too. Um, peach leaf curl seen in the younger leaves can be caused by a fungus and Eugenia curl is caused by a psyllid, a jumping type of plant lice. So it's not all from aphids but they're similar in how those plant pests affect the leaves and the, the shape of the leaves. The psyllids are also piercing insect plant pests they cause various types of damage, as I mentioned in the last slide. You can see um, the picture on the right. The common damage is this bubbly kind of looking leaves um, that's really common on the Eugenia. The Asian citrus psyllid has caused a lot of damage to crops throughout the United States, um, especially to the citrus crop. And a lot of people, including the citrus farmers, spray the psyllids to kill um, off of to kill the psyllids off of their citrus crops, but they are also killing the local native beneficial insects. So a lot of these um, chemical methods are, um, are not targeted to a specific pest. They are broad spectrum killing many insects, including all the beneficial ones. So we have to be really careful using them. Some other piercing insects um, are aphids, scale, whitefly, and leafhoppers. Also, bugs, which are in a different category, um, green stink bug, cinch bug, and con conspirous stink bug. And moving on now to rasping insect plant pests. Here's some of the type of damage you'll see on your plants, especially on the undersides of leaves. Thrips are one of these pests that cause the damage that you just looked at. In addition to thrips, um, mites are miniature spiders, not really insects, but we throw them in this category. They are a rasping plant pest. And leaf miners are also a rasping plant pest. They're the ones that cause these little squiggly lines inside the leaves of plants, especially citrus. You can see if you look at the picture and that the squiggly whitish line on that leaf on the bottom, you can see where the egg was laid. The eggs are laid by the adults inside between the upper and the lower levels of the cells of that leaf and it hatches as a small um, leaf miner and as it chews through the inside of that little sandwich of those two layers of the leaf it grows so that that squiggly line is the path that it has taken as it chews and matures and the path gets wider and wider from the lowest point there to the highest point you can see that that little white path gets bigger. And here, following this slide, are some more uh, examples of insect damage to plants. Ants are pests in the garden. The ants don't eat the plants directly, but if you see ants on your shrubs, fruit trees, they are causing a problem because they farm aphids, as you see in this image. They will do everything they can to keep the aphids alive on your fruit trees and shrubs so that they can um, farm them. They like to eat the honeydew that comes out of the aphids and they'll even pack soil sometimes around the aphids and um, protect them and keep them warm at night so they, the aphids keep making this sugary honeydew that's excreted from the aph aphids and eaten by the ants. So. Excluding ants from your plants is a way to keep down aphid and other pest problems too. You can imagine if there are aphids on your plant and they're being managed and protected by ants, 
then you also have secondary problems from the, all the holes that the aphids are making in your plant, like sooty mold getting in there and other things. The plant is now compromised, has lots of little wounds, and other diseases can get in. So excluding ants from your plants is a, a really good way to um, minimize a lot of different plant pest problems. Sometimes called plant lice, aphids are a big problem and a big focus of pest control in plants, including IPM. And as um, we said in the previous slide, you can even see some ants on these leaves here. Um, using something like a, a very low dilution boric acid is natural, it's not toxic, but if you set out the, the ant traps with that in it, it'll be, if you set, you um, put the liquid into those traps that's a low enough boric acid level diluted in water that the ants can't detect that it's in there and they bring the water back to the queen into the nest where it can start causing death. That's a good way to be able to prevent those ants from causing all these secondary problems like aphids. The four-lined plant bug, you can see it in the picture on the left, they can cause that stippled, spotted, transparent circles that look like just all the leaf tissue almost completely got eaten away almost overnight. Of course, grasshoppers, the very young stages that are really tiny, in the, like in the upper left picture, and the larger ones in the lower right, they can cause big damage to plants eating leaves and damaging them. An example of one type of caterpillar, the milkweed tussock moth caterpillar on a milkweed vine, which can eat numerous leaves in one day. You may have noticed these kind of big balls of, looks like a big spider web sack up in a tree. Um, I've seen them more in wetter areas in the Midwest and East Coast, but these web worms cause these, what's called like a, a caterpillar tent or a web tent up in the tree. And it, and it causes a lot of damage and death to the, the tissues of the leaves that they enclose and even the branches. A few more pictures and information about leaf miners. These shiny kind of bronzy green iridescent beetles that are actually really beautiful are the Japanese beetles and they will defoliate a tree or shrub in hours and there's usually quite a few of them. And I have seen them around here in Southern California. A cutworm, smooth and green, um, makes them really difficult to see, but um, the cutworm here in this image made short work of a newly emerging columbine plant. Note the black specks on the dandelion leaf underneath the worm. Those are the, the feces that are dropping from the worm itself. See if you can find it. So IPM insect pest control includes the same methods we've already described, mechanical types of control, cultural, chemical, and biological. Let's talk a little bit about each of those. So some mechanical devices that can be um, preventative, keeping the pest from getting to your plant. Um, you can put paper collars around particular plant stems, keeping out ants and cutworms, screens over beds of very juvenile and sensitive um, seedlings that you're growing, mesh covering over small fruit trees, sticky barriers on trunks to keep crawling insects from going up the trunk, and maybe even reflective plastic mulches to deter aphids and weeds. Also, hand picking the insects off as you see them or spraying with a power jet that doesn't damage the plant but knocks all the insects off. I use this method for the first line of attack for um, aphid infested insects. You can just, I use a you know, strong jet on the hose and just spray all the aphids off every couple of days for uh, a week or two. And usually it knocks that population back enough that they, they lose strength and they don't take over and do too much damage. There's also traps, like I mentioned with the ant traps of boric acid. And then you can also use light and temperature manipulations to control insects. There are some um, types of traps that, that use the light and composting to control soil-borne pest insects. Methods of cultural control of pests, um, using resistant varieties of plants. Also digging, tilling, and cultivating can expose the eggs or uh, larva, pupa of certain pests that are in the soil that hatch and come out onto your plant. Rotating crops in, in your vegetable garden um, is good so one pest doesn't take hold in that area in the soil and just get to keep eating the same crop year after year. 
and proper use of fertilizers. When you use synthetic chemical fertilizers, you're giving them a huge rush of, of, of fertilizer and growth, and that succulent new growth um, really attracts pests, and it's usually fast-growing tissues on plants are softer and it, they're more vulnerable, and um, you get a bigger pest outbreak in those situations. You can also change the harvesting times of plants. Let's say delay planting of corn until the soil is warm enough for the corn and bean seeds to germinate. And that reduces seed maggot damage. So if you have too wet and moist soil, you could encourage seed uh, maggots to come out. Um, but if you wait a little longer, it's past their prime and they'll, that'll uh, allow your crop to miss that particular stage of life's um, peak for the pest. Sanitary practices too, um, removing anything that has disease or residues of plants. If you're going to compost and you're worried about pests, it's better to take the, the green waste and compost it somewhere else. You could do it on site, but away from the plants that you got them from. Um, if you have a really bad pest, you might want to take um, that disease tissue and put it right in the green waste so it can be properly um, taken off site and hopefully composted fully. Fusarium wilt on tomatoes stays in the soil for seven years, so rotate the crops so they just don't keep getting your tomatoes every year. Companion planting, certain plants can help other plants deter pests. Also, even though there's, there's not a ton of scientific evidence that companion planting works, you might just want to do it because it creates a more diverse garden and pests are more confused and if they find a plant they like, right next to it is a different plant, so they may not just jump over to that plant and it keeps, it kind of breaks up their ability to, to move and, and damage more plants. A couple more ideas there too. If you are going to use chemical pest control methods for insects, use them at the correct time, season, and day, time of day. Um, and it minimizes the negative effects and makes their efficacy higher. Um, make sure you're using it on the appropriate life stage of the pest, so you're not just wasting the chemical and putting it out into the environment for no reason. If you're spraying the, 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 like the California oakworm moths, it's not going to do a lot of good. They probably already laid their eggs. You've got to spray it on the caterpillars. Need to use it in the correct location um, of the plant. Make sure you're targeting specifically the, the zone or the location where you see the outbreak. And make sure you're paying attention to weather conditions so the pesticides, if it's too windy, they might float away. Or if it's not the right weather where the insect is out, it, you may kind of miss your little window there. Timing can also help reduce negative effects. Um, Dormant insecticide sprays on deciduous trees can help reduce pests without harming the tree. So that's great if, if, you, if they work, you can use them during the dormant season of the fruit tree instead of the growing living season where it could harm the tree and maybe get on your fruit too. There's also a lot of um, natural methods, herbal or organic sprays, horticultural soaps. They can help reduce the pest, usually not get rid of it completely. And some biodynamic and biological controls um, work pretty well and they're preferred by a lot of people that are producing something that's going to be ingested by humans. So the definition of a biological pest control is any activity of one species that reduces the activity or vigor of another. So you're bringing in a species that you know is a predator of your pest species or it interrupts that life cycle of the, the pest species. Um, they're sometimes called beneficials or bennies um, they are naturally occurring. There's pathogens, parasites, predators, and competitors of your pest insects, and they all all naturally occurring, but they may not be right at your site, and there may not be enough of them. So sometimes you might want to attract them with plants or purchase them and bring them. Um, there's pathogens, bacteria, and fungi causing diseases in pest insects and mites and nematodes or weeds. So these can help reduce those pests and without using any kind of chemical. There's um, plant pest insect predators, so and they're usually larger than the, the pest that you're trying to control. There's competitors like cover crops, things that are plants that can compete for space with um, your weed pests. And there's antagonists. There's some types of um, biologicals 
are beneficials that uh, release toxins that can hurt your pest. And a few examples here. Here's a parasite. Um, and this aphid parasite lays its eggs, inserting them into the interior of the body of the aphid. And then when those eggs hatch, they eat the insides of the aphid from the inside out. Attachnid fly, these eggs are laid on the head or top of a caterpillar, and the same thing happens. They hatch and then they eat the brains out of the caterpillar. And the um, trichogramma wasp, inserting eggs into the caterpillar egg. Those are all the aphid parasite, the tachnid fly, and the trichogramma wasp, they all are beneficial insects attacking uh, pests of our plants. And everyone's heard of ladybugs being a great beneficial insect, and they are. Ladybug adults don't eat that many aphids. They eat some, but not that many. It's their larva, the ladybug larva shown in the image on the right, that eat a lot, and the lacewing larva. So those two are great predators of aphids and a few other insects. Here's a good website resource to help you identify garden and farm pest insects in case you're trying to figure that out. And you would need to if you're going to find the right uh, beneficial insect to combat that pest. Here's the larval stage of the green lacewing and the adult stage on the right, the larvas on the left. Sometimes the ones on the left are called, of the green lacewing larva, are called a aphid lion. They go around and munch on the aphids, as you see happening there. Beneficials are something that people like. If you're going to try to take care of a pest, okay, most people don't like the idea that you're spraying this nasty chemical. You might decide to do it because for some good reasons, but most people like the idea of beneficials and would like to start with that as something to try to control your pest. They're also effective if you get the right ones and you know you ID your pest well. They're inexpensive and they're easy and it just it's just kind of a nice idea to release these and let something else do the dirty work that doesn't harm your plants or the environment. Usually with the green lace wings you purchase the eggs and the larva hatch and feed on the aphids. Here's a list of some places that sell the beneficial insects and actually beneficial insects are starting to become a much bigger thing than even this short list. These are the things that were available about three years ago, but now you can get them even more places, even just at regular Ace Hardware, Home Depot, um, places that didn't used to carry them now are seeing that there's um, you know, a real market for them. But Rincon Vitova is one of the best places that carries many, many different beneficial insects. One of the easiest way easier than buying your beneficials is to plant plants that attract them naturally. Um, and here's a picture of an adult um, surfid fly feeding on the pollen and nectar of this aster family plant and they also the larvae of those feed on the aphids. So that's a great way you plant the plants that bring them in and then the, that's all you have to do. And actually besides that surfid fly there's also stingless wasps and the native green lacewing. They all um, feed on pollen and nectar of the plants that you can plant. And then they lay their eggs and their larvae eat up a lot of the different pests, including aphids. So the best flowers for attracting beneficials are upright. So they kind of have a little flat surface or something to land on. Lots of little flowers. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. This is a small table listing a few beneficial insects on the left and the pests that they are predators of on the right column. Here's a little bit more on plants that attract beneficial insects. In general, like I said earlier, plants with numerous small flowers that attracting insects, they will attract insects that have relatively small mouth parts and those tend to be the ones that are predators on, on our pest insects. So planting species with lots of small flowers um, and the upright presentation will naturally attract your beneficial insects. Things from the carrot family, buckwheat family, sunflower family, milkweed family, they're all really good plant families to uh, buy and purchase and plant for planting and attracting beneficial insects. Also think about this too, um, a lot of our insects don't fly very far. So if you can plant these, these um, plants that attract the beneficial 
beneficial insects, put them right next to your plant. You might want to plant them like right under your or around your fruit trees, intermixed with your vegetables or other more vulnerable species of plants that you're trying to protect. Here's a great and beautiful native buckwheat called a red flowered buckwheat and it attracts the minute pirate bug, tachinid flies, and hoverflies that are all great predators of pest insects. Common yarrow, a native plant and a great one also for attracting hoverflies, wasps, and lady beetles, and those are all beneficial insects. And the butterfly milkweed, and um, our, this is a native one, Asclepius fascicularis. But these are all so far, sh I'm showing you ones that you could buy at the Botanic Garden, which only carries natives. But other ones that are not natives but are similar, they would do the trick too. But if you're trying to attract the native uh, predators, those are the ones around the most in, in your locale or region, the native plants could be the best way to go. And one last example is goldenrod a native plant that has lots of little flowers. It's in the sunflower family and it will attract lots of great beneficial insects.